Monday, May 5th. I'm Scott. I'm Rim. Sneezy. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, the amazing, world-changing memory store. Let's do this. So, uh, it being another Visigothic weekend, we had to go out for dinner, as we do, and we, we always kind of go to the same places. Like, up, we go to the Cafe Maya, we go to the whatever, and we wanted to eat something different. What, what, what can we eat different here? Well, the thing is, the, there's fancy, expensive places, but we don't want to go get, like, a $40 dinner every weekend. That really doesn't work so well. No, not really. And there's one restaurant, one kind of food. That we ate a lot in Rochester, but we don't eat so much in Beacon, because while there is a restaurant that serves it, we have had a somewhat colored history with this restaurant. Oh, oh I know what you're going to talk about. The Sukatai in Beacon. It's Thai food. It's pretty good Thai food. And it's, it's, it's okay. It's not as good as the King and I in Rochester. No. And it, a, and they it, get that garlic pepper beef? Oh, man. And it doesn't really hold a candle then, to anything in the city. And then you would get the garlic pepper chicken, and then we would both basically get garlic pepper beef chicken? We'd also get, like, four or five meats on sticks. Yeah, something like that. But that was just a given. You mean satay? Meat on stick for the uninitiated. Yeah, correct. It's, it's meat on a stick. I love meat on a stick, let me tell you. If there, is, if there is any way to eat meat on a stick, it's probably the second best way to eat meat. But, um... Uh, you see, a while ago, we'd sworn off the Sukhothai because we'd gone one time with a group of like six or seven people, and I walked in, and I said, hey, how long's the wait for seven? And the guy said, just a minute. And like ten minutes go by. So I go back up and say, hey, uh, how long's the wait going to be? I've already been here like ten minutes. He says, just a minute. All right. This repeats for a while. Finally, we say, screw it, and just walk out and eat at the place across the street. Mm. We go back like a month later, and the same thing happens. So we swore the place off, just terrible service, and the price wasn't... We've eaten there successfully a few times, but not recently. Yeah, and I don't know if it's under new management, or I don't know what the deal is, but we've been getting our Thai food in the city instead, where it's much better anyway. But uh, this weekend, we decided, you know what? We all really want Thai food. Let's chance it, and if we fail, there's that good Italian place right across the street. Yep. So we're sta- now Emily and I went ahead to try to get a table, and as we're walking in, there was a portent. You see, <laughs> for a car slowed and it was full of punk kids, like p- punk collegey kids. Window rolls down, and I, they yell, "Fuck you, Sukatai! Fuck you! Fuck you, Sukatai!" And then they speed off. Did they see now that the question is, were they just in general saying fuck you to everything they passed or were they specifically targeting the Sukhothai? It was definitely a specific Sukhothai target because they drove up, slowed down to a stop pretty much outside of the Sukhothai, called it out by name, then rolled up the window and continued. Hmm. So sure there's a story there somewhere. I'm sure there is. So whatever. Emily and I go in. I say, how long's the wait for nine? And the woman says, just a minute. And I say, well, just a minute before I get a table or just a minute before you tell me how long the wait is. And she says, just a minute. Mm. So, all right. I say, all right, I'll be standing outside. Will you come get me when you know? And she said, yeah. So I go outside. We wait a while. I walk back in. Hey, uh, so can I get a table? Just a minute. All right. Are you going to give us the table or not? <laughs> uh, let me talk to the manager. <laughs> <laughs> manager comes over and I'm like, hey, uh, how long's the wait? No one seems to be able to tell me. I got nine people. We're hungry. And he says, oh, whoa, 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 just a minute. And then he walks away. To which I say, all right, screw this. Yep. <laughs> we went across the street and I got some lobster ravioli instead. Sukotai in Beacon, New York. Do not eat there ever. I don't know if it's that they don't like large parties, but that's not it because there was a party of 11 already in there. It looked like that was a, a reserved party that had a reservation, but... You know, still, they definitely don't mind a large party. But I I think maybe they just don't like young people because there were, I I realized, there were no parties of young people in that place. Mm -hmm. Might have just been a coincidence. I don't know. It's not like that time Scott and I went to the Italian place in Fishkill where I was dressed like a hobo and we we looked like people who could not afford to be eating there. (laughs) Yeah, but they let us in. They, they f- did. They and fed us. I now, mean, we went to that this fancy forty dollars steak place, not dressed up at all, and they they fed us. I was wearing like shorts and a scuzzy old webcomic t shirt. I was wearing shorts and a t shirt, and they totally fed us, and they kept filled my water far too often. No, when we went to that uh, place when I was dressed like dressed like a hobo, they let us in and they served us. But 
I remember they looked at me a little bit odd when I ordered wine. Yeah. How much for the girls? Uh, your women. How much your for women. your women? How much for the women? I want to buy your women, your wife, your little girl. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, we'll talk about the Visigoth thing on uh, Tuesday where it's more relevant. Yeah. So I bought my new computer. Yes, you did. We had that old, we had a server that died, right? And I had my old computer, which still worked, right? So I said, you know, I'll combine the server that died and my old computer that still works and make a working computer, and that will be the new server, because I really need a DNS server. It's really hard to do web development without some sort of DNS. Now, something must have happened, because the equation, I think what you intended was broken computer plus working computer equals better computer. But instead, you got working computer times broken computer equals all broken computers. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. I mean... It's sort of one of those situations where the parts, I'm pretty sure, still work. But, like, if you screw the motherboard into the case, then the case sort of touches the motherboard in a bad way. It's a bad (laughs) touch, if you will. (laughs) I need an adult. It's a bad touch. The motherboard is, where did did he touch you, motherboard? In a bad (laughs) way. It was was Scott Johnson, and he had the sweater on. Because, like, if I take the motherboard, right, out of the case, and I rest it on, like, a static bag and boot it, it works. So I just got to screw it into the case in, like, a very careful way where everything's lined up and nicely only touching the good places, and then it will boot properly. If I don't, it goes... Which is very annoying. Of course, you know, my computer, my old computer, Shazar, did that whenever it overheated. And I think you remember that I solved that pretty handily by unplugging the PC speaker. Yeah, no, but um, I've got, uh, the thing is, right, I'm going to get this computer working somehow. Alex also has some parts, so we can combine those two. But I've got a lot of extra parts for computers. And, like, some of them I like to have extra parts, so I don't want to get rid of all of them. But some of them are, like, working, but just not necessary. Like, I do not need three 300-watt power supplies when I only have, like, two computers that could possibly use them. We're going to have more. I have that other power supply that wouldn't work with my motherboard, but it's otherwise fine. And... I'm buying a new power supply just because the one I have now is loud. I still have my my first com- my first computer that was mine personally, my Abit BX6 R2 motherboard with the Pentium 3450 slot 1 CPU in it, and I have RAM for it, and that is the most reliable computer in the known universe, and it still works, I'm sure. But I have no use for it unless I really want to make a DOS computer. But we have DOSBox now, the piece of software DOSBox, so yeah, it's really a time not necessary. When anyone who was Anyone who would really consider themselves a PC gamer kept around an old Pentium box to play DOS games, but that that technology, we have averted that. We no longer need these old archaic devices. Yeah, if you don't know what DOS box is, if you install like old DOS games in Steam, like say Doom, it uses DOS box to make those games work. Yeah, or if you're hardcore, DOS EMU. That's, stu- that's stupid hardcore, unnecessarily hardcore, in fact. But yeah, so I'm just having a little trouble putting some computers together. We'll see how this goes. But I'm going to try to find, because I know there's those places that just take donations of old computer parts and then sort of do what I'm doing and make working computers and give them to people who don't have computers. You know what? And teach them how to use them. You should just give them all to Scott Johnson, because he has a collection of not working computers that would rival many museums. But he doesn't do anything with them. Well, he slowly builds computers. You should open up one of those places that takes donations and builds computers and gives them to people. Ah. Those places are actually really cool. I don't know if there's one nearby us, but I know there's one in California. I saw a video about it. And basically, they take you in, right? And they'll, they collect parts from donations, right? They take people in. The people test parts to see if they work or not, right? And the people learn how to build a computer. And the, the deal is you come in, you build X number of computers, and you get to keep one. So, and then they, the other computers go to people who need computers who don't have them. And they just build, like, really crappy but working computers. Which is fine for Grandma. Yeah, it's, it's great for Grandma. It's also great for Homeless Guy and uh, also great for Crazy Guy. And, oh, man, uh, speaking of fine for Grandma, I got to burn a nice Ubuntu CD because Red Hat Workstation, not cutting it. No, not at all. Oh, well, I had the pleasure of talking to Red Hat Enterprise Support. Now, <laughs> wow, back, do you get to pay for that? Well, back when I worked at IBM, we had Red Hat support, and uh, I never got anything out of them. And uh, sure enough, I can't get any useful information. They don't really offer support, as far as I can tell. What are, I, they, what are you paying for? I don't know. 
this is an experiment, so I think my uh, next test is going to be Will Ubuntu boot? <laughs> Followed by, look everybody, Ubuntu is better. And another thing, right, is I, I have two 17-inch monitors on my desk, right, that I'm using with the new computer. Right? Scott bought those things back when you could not okay. use for, LCDs for gaming okay. unless you bought the one that Scott okay. had. Way back in the day, right, if you wanted an LCD monitor and you wanted to play games, it was impossible. I mean, it worked, but you would get this ghosting effect because the refresh rates of the monitor were so slow that, like, by it would draw the... It, like, if you were moving left and right in an FPS, just, like, aim to the left, aim to the right... It wouldn't erase fully the gun on the left before it drew it on the right. It was so, awful. So everything was like had this ghost. It was like you could see the ghost of your former self. Like if a bad guy moved, you could see where he just was and where he was now, and it really sucked. And then eventually they got the monitors to a point where they had a 12 millisecond refresh rate. and that That's was, pretty much the line. That's the line. It's like 12 milliseconds. Now there's no ghosting when you play an FPS at 75 frames per second, right? So I was like, hot shit. And so I went, and it was also, it's a really nice monitor. Like, it can adjust in all different directions. And it would, like, there's barely any plastic around the screen itself. I hate that. When there's, like, a monitor, and then around the monitor, there's all this plastic or speakers or any other shit like that. That's oh. why I'm, I'm really liking these. Uh, Dell is rocking with the wide screen. Dell, Dell has conquered the monitor world. Like, ViewSonic is down the shitter. And, but anyway, so... I have two. I bought the first one when it was $500. I think it might have been $550. So that was poor at RIT, relatively poor anyway. Yeah. I got a Samsung 17-inch LCD, the, the 172X, famous monitor. Like, I remember back then. In I those a... days, everyone, if you said what monitor do I buy, everyone said 172X. And then later on, I bought another 172X, like right before they now were Now this presented a problem because then Scott realized that his one he'd had for so long had a little bit of a problem with the backlight. Yeah, I know. It's like I turned the new one on, and the old one I thought was just fine, but turning the new one on, it was like twice as bright as the old one. Now, I don't know if they maybe made changes to it along the you know production process, or if it I damaged the backlight or something, because it has even lighting. It's just as dim lighting compared to the newer one. So now I have a bright 17-inch LCD and a dim 17-inch LCD, but they both work. They both work well enough to see. One just has unreliable color, and I, you know, is, is not is only good for like a side monitor, not a primary monitor. And I've had these two monitors for a while, and I feel really bad replacing them because they cost so much money. But a Dell UltraSharp 20-inch widescreen is $250, which makes me feel terrible. You know, you could just use three monitors. No, I don't have room on my desk, or I would. You could have two monitors, have the widescreen, and then the other one. That's what I'm going to do, probably. But uh, that's a good I idea. went to the Dell website, right? Now, here's, here's, uh, here's a few things I got to say about this. Number one, widescreen monitors, right? They are a good deal, and they're just fine. I mean, buy one. I, I recommend it. But they're not as good a deal as you think. Because think about this, well, right? Lo look at a square and then look at a rectangle and do some geometry knowing that they measure diagonally. And I think it's self-evident. Well, think about this, okay? 20-inch widescreen, resolution, 1680 by 1050. 22-inch widescreen, same resolution. You're not getting any more screen real estate. All you're doing by buying the 22-inch is you can sit farther away. That's well, the only difference. Well, no, the thing is, I prefer, to a degree, a larger one because... Well, yeah, besides sitting farther away, what advantage is there? It's bigger. That what's the advantage besides being able to sit farther away? What's the advantage of it being bigger? It's bigger. You can see more. You can see it more easily. You see, you can sit slightly farther away, or sit closer, and it's even clearer. Uh, I don't see any other because advantage you know your old credo of a uh, resolution is all that matters. Resolution. Fine. Then get like a twelve-inch monitor with like a nineteen hundred by whatever crazy resolution. There's a there's a point at which it becomes silly. yeah 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 whatever. I, pr I it does it's not true to the extreme, but it's true for two inches. No, I'm very much because I had at work I had a twenty-inch sixteen you know this sixteen uh whatever sixteen hundred by ten fifty or sixteen eighty by ten fifty. And then at home, I got the 22-inch, 1680 by 1050. I much prefer the 22-inch. Uh-huh. Anyway, I prefer the 1680 by 1050. So then at work, I got, an, I got another 1680 by 1050, 22-inch. And then right. I got another one. <laughs> at work, I have a 22-inch. I'm not a fan. But anyway, the if you look, a 20-inch square non-widescreen monitor is 1600 by 1200. 1600 times 1200 is a lot more than 1680 times 1050. 
That's why the square monitor is five hundred dollars and the widescreen is two fifty. I still that's think you're better ev- off with the widescreen. Yeah, that's why every laptop today is widescreen because they can advertise more inches, right? Because that's what people look at, the inches, but they're actually you have less overall space. And they save money. And that's why it seems like such a deal. Like, oh my God, 20-inch monitor for almost nothing. Well, actually, a 19-inch square monitor is bigger than that 20-inch, you know, (laughs) in terms of square inches and pixels and things. Yeah, of course, pretty much every usability study shows that except for very specific applications, you're usually better off having more horizontal space. Well, the reason you're better off with horizontal space is because horizontal scrolling is a million times worse than vertical scrolling. But also, the side-by-side and toolbars and docking and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still like having separate monitors as well, but... Well, but that's, the, the not, reason... that's not for, like, viewing. That's for, like, workflow. Right, right, right. Now... Which is a totally different issue. So, I, anyway, I, still, I think I'm going to buy the 20-inch Dell widescreen because it can rotate sideways and be tall. So when Be I... warned. <laughs> be warned. Because I did that at work just to see, because, like, hee-hee. And I realized something. Uh, pretty much every LCD monitor, you know, they have the viewing angle, and they've really gotten the uh, horizontal viewing angles to be a lot better than they used to be. The vertical viewing angle, not so much. Yeah, so if you turn it vertically, your viewing angle goes to shit. The thing is, that's okay, because I would only turn it vertically when I'm coding, which is pretty much just text, and I'll be able to see anyway. And see, that's when so I can I'm... get a really tall VI and see lots of code at once. Honestly, if I were coding more than I do now, I would have two wide screens, one vertical, one horizontal. Oh, that's not bad. But yeah, that's I don't what have I would room do. on my desk for that. Otherwise, I might buy that. But uh, the thing is, I went to the Dell website, and I'm pretty sure I did actually buy the monitor, but I didn't get an email. So I'm not sure if it went through or not. And I'm, I'm like, I could just go buy it again. but Just buy it I'm, again. The thing is, am I too going to show up? I got to go check to see if they charge my credit card to figure out if I bought it or not. Just get on that. Yeah, I'm going to check uh, after the show. And then if I didn't, if it, do, it wasn't charged to my credit card, I'll buy it. And if they send me two, I just won't open one and I'll return it. But uh, before we get on to the news, if I sound a little bit weird, probably for the rest of this week. You have horrible allergies. I am allergied to a degree. Do you want to talk is... about the chromium sodium I'm fiasco? Gonna, I'm going to save that. But All suffice right. to say, no one sells chromium sodium around here. And every pharmacist I've talked to has pretty much said, yeah, no one wants real medicine. They'd rather use that Zycam crap. Yeah, that doesn't work and actually destroys your Yeah, one your sense pharmacist was like, yeah, that stuff doesn't work. Zycam, if you use it, it will destroy your sense of smell. As in, you use it, you use it again, you use it again. Not only will it not do anything that it's supposed to do, or, or is, yeah, it says it will do, but you eventually won't be able to smell things. Isn't that wonderful? You know what, though? Even worse, a lot of people, like... I guess if there's a lot of poop around, or if you're like... You know, well, no, no, worse than that. Aseptic tank guy. You Zycam look, is great. And other than the Zycam, they sell, like, there's a million nose sprays. But they're all actually the same thing as Afrin. Well, they're oxy whatnot. There's well, also, no, no, well, there's they, actually no, another forget kind. forget that. I'm not talking about that crap one. I'm talking about one that works. Afrin. It's uh, something hydrochloride. Yeah, that's the one I was just talking about. Might be, because there's another Because I went, something. I was in the store, and I looked at the nose sprays, and I saw four kinds. Saline, af- Afrin, oxy, whatever. Something else that was like phospho something something and bullshit Zycam. But the thing is, the Afrin one, don't take that either. Because, yeah, that'll decongest someone. But then, if you don't take it again, you'll double congest. Uh, and it, it, like, the, the re, like, it's this known rebound problem. There was actually a, um, a Mucinex brand nose spray, but it was just the Afrin. Yeah, it was. And they had another one that was just the other kind. So was See, like- the thing <laughs> is, I like Mucinex, but... Now that I know all about it, I just buy gene- like the three different ingredients that make up the different mucinexes and just make the same dosage. Yeah, I, I bought the... Because uh, what? There's the cough suppressant, there's the expectorant, and there's the, uh, the, the third part. Oh, the pseudofedrin. Yeah, I bought the pseudofedrin mucinex. I think you, that, that'll last me forever. Yeah, well, we've got all different three kinds. We've got every combination for every sickness. For our meth lab. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, I don't have a lot to say about this, but in the news... Uh, people are talking about how there might be, this is purely speculation. Speculation. But uh, MacGyver movie, to which I said, 
But there was already a MacGyver movie. I did not know this. I, I saw it. When where, I was a kid. Found, it turned like, out that the, the still was causing lead poisoning, and they found the woman's skull. See, and, when I was a kid, I, I MacGyver, remember, like, my cartoons awesome. would be over, and then I would see the MacGyver opener, and they would have commercials, like, up next, MacGyver, and then I would, like, you know, turn it off and eat dinner. I would skip the commercials and skip the cartoons and then sit down to watch me some MacGyver, because I got to tell you what, Richard Dean Anderson is awesome. You know, I watched MacGyver a few times. It was okay. I liked it. I like the fact that... It's better for making funny jokes about, you know, blowing up buildings with paper clips. It was a pretty good show, all things considered. The science, not always quite on the spot. Yeah, I mean, there were, there were better shows. I mean, Mission Impossible is a better show. Eh, uh, you know. I preferred MacGyver. Nah, anyway. Plus, Richard Dean Anderson. Yeah, MacGyver, like, you know what was on in that time slot before MacGyver when I was a kid? For me, it was the A-Team. For me, it was 21 Jump Street was on that uh, time slot. You know what? I never actually watched 21 Jump me Street. Me either. I saw the opener, and then I turned it off. I always saw the dinner. closer. I'd always be like, like, I'd turn on the TV, and it'd be like the end of 21 Jump Street. And I always wondered what it was about. Yeah, I basically, it was like, oh. I, I, I assumed it was like kids in a drug-infested school. I but. watched my cartoons, and then this live-action show opener would start, and I would turn it off and eat dinner. Oh, those are the days. All right. I'm looking up what 21 Jump Street was. Oh, shit. Can, you want me to do my news? All right, do your news. So, Blu-ray beat the shit out of HD DVD. That was a few months ago, right? Well, that's kind of like saying that, yeah. I beat the shit out of that baby. <laughs> that one baby beat up that other baby. Right. Um, the news now, which isn't really news, because they've sort of just been saying the same thing, and it's sort of been true for a long time. It's just suddenly all the news organizations have decided to talk to, you know, put the story up. Blu-ray sales stagnant, unlikely to improve this year. Pretty much they're saying exactly what everyone said before. Regardless of who wins this war, right, which is already won, the war's over, um, people are happy with DVDs. Blu-ray or HDVD, but basically Blu-ray has no significant advantage over DVD that makes people want to switch to it. You know, I mean, most people don't even have HD TVs. If they did, they don't even, most people don't even hook them up right. Blu-ray players are really expensive. The discs are really expensive. There's a rumor going around. There's a rumor going around. There's a rumor around. that started with the guy who's the head of Netflix that they're going to charge more for renting a Blu-rays. Uh... And people already have large DVD collections. They're happy with their DVDs. Uh, and Blu-ray is really not selling except for in the PS3. And the PS3 isn't really selling, at least not until the Metal Gear comes. I mean... Honestly, I think part of what's doing the it... The GTA will sell a few PS3s, but it's selling 360s I think it's just well. that there's kind of been a general economic slowdown and... Blu-ray is very yeah, expensive. Yeah, in an economic slowdown, people are not going to go and switch up their cheap DVD players for the Blu-rays and HD TVs. Well, That's not still, at the top of the, the list. The standalone players are hella people expensive. People can't even afford gas and food. They are hella expensive. Yeah, and gas... You know, it's even more hella expensive? A, a drive for your computer. I didn't even, Actually, no. Blu-ray drives are stupidly cheap. Really? Yeah, they're like ludicrously cheap. Maybe I should go. In uh, fact, they come late. with like all the laptops. Well, now. all the Dell laptops come with them, which is sort of like supposed to be the deal. Like everyone's like, hey, don't buy a Blu-ray player. Just buy a Dell laptop and then use the TV out and you'll be all set, which is not a bad idea, really. Yeah, the if thing you need is, a laptop at least. Don't I, don't buy that instead of a player. I'm sure the player's cheaper than a laptop. You know what? I'll be honest. You're probably if you want a Blu-ray player, you're best off getting a PS3. The PS3 really is the best bet for the Blu-ray player, but from what I read, it's better the, it, than all the real Blu-ray players. Regard, it's cheaper and better. Yeah, and the PS3, you know, it has some good stuff going on. It has uh, Gran Turismo. Well, it has Gran Turismo. It all. So, Twenty One Jump Street, nineteen eighty-seven. <laughs> good uh, God. I, my brother was one. That was more than a decade ago. I was ago. five. All the old people who are older than me feel old. All the young people weren't born yet. Punk kids. Quote, 21 Jump Street is the headquarters for a squad of police officers who specialize in investigations relating to young people. Each of the Jump Street personnel was selected for their ability to pass for high school students. Allowing them to operate undercover in areas where it is difficult for regular police officers to blend in unnoticed. Uh, I, I guess I was right. I thought it was about, like, kids in high school with drugs. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. All right. Yeah, is that what is, was your news or what? Well, you just did your news. Yeah, what's your news? I said there's going to be maybe another MacGyver movie. Oh, that was your news? That's all I got. On Monday? Yeah, MacGyver, science and tech. <laughs> all righty. Let's go to things of the day.
So, things of the day. Uh, this isn't related at all to Monday, so forget it, whatever. Uh, I found well, this guy really randomly. you it in. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm full of allergies, and it's kind of late. You just, you've just been constantly sneezing for, like, hours. Yeah, I keep hitting the mute button and, like, blowing my nose for five minutes. Did it's you awful. order the, the stuff online? Yeah, but it won't be here for a while. Uh, Plus, it takes, like... How much like, did you order? A lot, hopefully? I bought a case of it. There you go. Enough Plus, to last uh, you a few years. It takes about a week for it to take effect. That's fine. But anyway... You're the one suffering. I'm only suffering partially. This is from some TV show. I'll admit... 21 I, Jump Street? I wish. I have no People idea... People are going to be talking about 21 Jump Street in the forums. I think we're going to have to do a show about 21 Jump Street. I've never seen it! Me either. <laughs> what the fuck? Thursday, we'll Skype someone in who liked it. <laughs> we can't, that's not a show. So, I, I think the guy on the left is Doogie Howser... And I don't know who Amy... What's with the old TV shows today? <laughs> I don't know. Who, no, the, the actor who played Doogie Howser. <laughs> all right, all right. Not, not the real Doogie he's Howser. He's supposed to be like, he's, he's an infamous dude. Well, you learn that from Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, we should do a show on that. It's not worthy of a show. It, half of it was worthy of a show. Oh, anyway, get anyway, on with your thing of the day. Get on with it? Get on with it. All right. I don't know what this show is, some kind of talk show, but they're talking, and these two guys are talking about how, with their friends, like, yeah, they would, like, sing the confrontation song from Les Miserables at each other. And I found that funny, because when I was in high school, we totally did that with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the gothic musical thriller. But not, only... not well. Oh, no, no, well, I'll get to that. <laughs> the only difference between what me and my friends did in high school and what these people are doing on this video is that they can sing and good God, am I never going to sing anything from Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the gothic musical thriller again. I mean, listen I to these think... guys, like I, I thought it was, they were just playing like the album that you can, you know, the CD of, you know, Les Miserables that you can buy in the store. They it sounded sounds just lot... like it. Well, they, they definitely use the phrasing of the original British cast as opposed to some of the later casts. Yeah. I mean, that's the one that I know because I mean I saw it once live you know on Broadway but mostly I've heard the CD or I well, guess the VHS I'm not, the, the I'm not going tape. to sing but there are two different like styles for doing Les Mis and in the opening scene like one guy one way where they're like now bring me prisoner two four six so like they kind of drag it out and the other styles are like now bring me prisoner two four six so one and then all this pause yeah that's the, the one music. that I hear that's the one that you heard yeah, that's the one I've always heard yeah I, I never heard that other one when I saw it I saw I, the other I, I one I think that's even the one that I saw on Broadway did it the second way I saw both on Broadway huh I saw Les Mis like four times though because it was high that's school that the, the greatest part about seeing that play is the turning stage it's just this God. big circle and it turns around and it goes woo I remember talking to the cast after, and I then got, like those guys, like when they the, the, they got like the, the the chain gang and they're walking, look but down. They're, they're staying still, but they're walking because it's a spinning circle. And they, I learned one the guys thing: practice walking at the same speed as the circle. I talked to the cast afterward because it was like this high school trip, so I got this big poster actually with like the cast signing it. But oh man, high school! All right, so when you went to see Les Mis, right? Which guy got the most applause of anybody? Obviously, it was the Ethernadiers. Ah, uh, yes. That is correct. We had like the, I saw like the best guy who was in that part ever. It's always the best guy in that part. Yeah. And the guy who played the sad guy looked exactly like Stephen Wright and sounded exactly like Stephen Wright. No, I don't, I don't, I don't think it was Stephen Wright. No, no, no. It's all about... What do you mean you don't remember? You didn't see it at like the Pantages. No. <laughs> <laughs> but... Anyway, I'll, I'll skip all that. All I learned is that it's really, really hard to walk on that stage. Yeah, it really is. Okay, so check but, uh, this video. They, they're, they're like, yeah, we used to do this to each other when we were friends but way back. And they're like, well, now you have to do it. So they do it, and it's great. Yep, I, I just said it was great before. Yeah, but now I'm saying it's great. Thus concluding my thing of the day, and now I can blow my nose while you do yours. All right, so... Uh, I, we, me and Emily, and so, you know, we're talking before a while, a week or so ago, and I was actually ta thinking about this even before then, and you know, and basically, we live in a house that doesn't have a basement, doesn't have a garage, right? But we're nerdy type people, and we want to do workshop kind of things. Like, I want to cut some wood to make woodworking projects, or like I wanna, when I made that DDR pad. Yeah, I want to do in the day. I, I want to do some metal working. You know, I'll maybe like machine some parts to like. You know, maybe if I want to do one of those like uh, cool like how to do it yourself hack things, like a portable SNES, I need to machine some parts, right? And I need a metal uh, a metal working shop or something, or maybe I 
want to weld something. You know, I need, I don't have a welder. I'm not going to buy a welder, but I might need to weld something once in a while. And it's, yeah. And unless you have like the resources and the space and the time to set all this up, you either have to give up, find someone else who has the stuff or go the half-assed way. And the half-assed way, it resulted in me burning myself a lot. Right. So it's like at RIT, I found out too late that there were actually metalworking labs that I could just use. And I, it was sort of like I was almost graduated. And I was like, wait a minute. I could just come to this lab and make stuff. They're like, oh, yeah, you're a student here. What is your tuition paying for? I'm like, nobody tells me. And it was too late to get all Make Magazine up in that business. So uh, it never happened. But, you know, lately I kind of want to be all Make Magazine up in this business, but it's not easy. Well, somebody solved this problem before I did, and I just had to find out about them too late. It's called Tech Shop. Build your dreams here. And what they do is it's sort of like, you know, you know how you have a workout gym, like a sports club, right, where they have all these big expensive machines you can't afford, but you go and you pay a membership fee, and then you can go and use their machines whenever you want. This is the same thing, only for tools and tech things and metalworking. And the best thing is they know that most people, because there's a lot more tools than there are workout machines, right? They know that most people only know how to use a few of the tools. So they have like all these classes where you know how to use these three machines and he knows how to use those three machines and you sort of teach each other. So everyone learns how to use all the machines they need to use. And That's a really good idea because you get out of your element really quick. It's like, all right. I got this jigsaw down. I can jig. Yeah, here, and then you go over to the bandsaw, and it's like, all right. Here's what it says. This on the- may look like a jigsaw, but it does not act like a jigsaw. Right, here's what it says on the side of their website. Open classes as of Monday the 5th at 5.41 p.m. Introducting to soldering basics, CNC vinyl cutter SBU, English wheel and cold form metal shaping, introductions to carbon fiber, CNC plasma cutter SBU. I want to take the plasma cutter class. Sweet. But basically, um, there's all like one, two, three, four, five, six of these things in fucking California. There's like two or there's like two, one in Seattle, one in Portland, one in Texas, one in Florida, and one in North Carolina. New York City, come on, step it up. I need uh, I need a lab here. Someone <laughs> out there, you want a business opportunity well, in the, Manhattan? Yeah, the thing is, the way these things work, the way they're funded, see. Most people don't realize this. The way uh, uh, a workout gym makes its money, like a New York sports club or a Gold's Gym or any of those places, the way they make their money is this. They have big membership drives. They say, join, 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 right? And they charge like 30 bucks a month or something like that. And people join, 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 but hardly anyone actually goes. Like a, such a small percentage of the people actually show up. Well, it depends. If you go to a gym between... January 2nd and, like, January 8th, it'll be packed. Right, right, right. But they don't go back. No, no, no. Like, people will go once, and they usually won't come back. If everyone who actually had a membership went regularly, they'd be out of business because they would have to buy so many machines, you know, to keep up with it that they would be screwed. So they buy a very small amount of machines have a very large membership that they can't realistically accommodate. Sort of like ISPs. They have very little bandwidth, and all these people pay for the bandwidth, but only a few people actually use it a lot, and thus they get away with not having enough bandwidth to support everyone using all of the bandwidth they pay for at once. So that's how gyms make their money. This place can't do that because you'd be damn sure anyone who pays is showing up, right? So what do they do? What they do is they get loans, but they don't get loans from the bank. They get loans from people in the community who want to be members. So like, let I would get, if a place like this wanted to open up, I, Scott Rubin, would give them like a $25,000 loan. They would pay me back. And I would be like a member and I'd be able to vote and all. maybe I'd even own part of the place. You yeah, know? It's, it's called a business. Right, right, right. <laughs> but it's, you know, that's how they do it. Like these community loan deals. And I, I think that's a pretty cool idea. And I think that's probably the only way that something like this would ever be able to exist short of Bill Gates just giving them the money or something like that. So, yeah. Come on. We need this in New York. I need to make things. Come on. All right. So... We were thinking about talking about the Memorister for the main kind of we show. We probably here. should. You got a better idea? I don't know. It's already 9.30. I'm feeling tired and allergy. You can talk about anything. You can talk about something. I could just cop. I could bail. Nah, don't bail. Don't bail? All right, Scott. So uh, how does a Memorister work? I forget the chemical. No, no, but can... like, like, what are the inputs and outputs? I'm... How stateful is it? It's analog stateful. 
but no, no, no. I mean, how, how, how stateful as in, does it keep its state forever? Does it need to be refreshed at all? No, it doesn't need to be refreshed. Well, Ever. It, it might in a very, very long time, but not, you know, in a short time. All right. All right. Off to a good start here. Yes. Okay, let's 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 go back a little bit, right? In electronics, right, there are three things that make pretty much every electronic device is made up of three things. It's made up of uh resistors, uh inductors, and capacitors. Now, why are those the three fundamental components as opposed to say diodes or other things? Well, a diode is actually a combination of resistors, capacitors, is it? and inductors. I'm pretty sure. Is it? I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> I might be wrong. I don't have an electronics degree. <laughs> I don't know that much about it. What I know does PV equals what, NRT. What does a diode do? <laughs> it, it has three prongs on it. No, it has two. <laughs> no, nah, I don't know. I've used ones with three prongs. Are you sure those weren't transistors? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, I know a transistor also has three prongs. Anyway, we, we suck at electronics. What are, the, what are the inputs and outputs on a transistor? Oh, a transistor. Okay, I know how a transistor works because that's my... That's PNP my... or NPN? <sighs> <laughs> a transistor has one in and one out, and then there's the toggle on the top where you sort of... It's, if, it's, if there's electricity going in the top, then it, it's a pass-through. If it's not going in the top, then it doesn't pass through, and that's, that's how it works. Anyway. All right, so continue. So recently... All right, there was a there was a theoretical, you know, since the seventies, you know, since a long time ago, there was a theoretical fourth component of electronics. There was the memristor, and it was only on paper. Like no one actually had one of these things, but like if you did the math, you said, "Aha, there could be this other fourth thing," but it doesn't exist. And people from time to time tried to make it, and it never really worked out until very recently. HP actually made it, and that's crazy. Like, holy shit crazy, but people don't realize how crazy it is because, like me, they don't understand electronics. And I'm sure that I already know some of our friends are like, uh, Scott, you know nothing about electronics. And they're going to start emailing and forming saying how moron I am. But that's what I get for not reading the Wikipedia before doing this episode and Rim not saying much and helping me out. Mostly, <laughs> mostly challenging me and exposing my lack of electronics knowledge, which is fine because I, I admit I lack electronics knowledge. Well, you see, I don't know a lot, but... I know that a diode does not have three <laughs> terminals. I remember make it, putting a, making a little project. It was like a little burglar alarm, and they, they said, yeah, put the diode there, and it had three prongies on the bottom. It was like a little black square. Are you sure that wasn't a transistor? I, might, I don't know anymore. I think it was a transistor. Anyway, it could have been. I, I don't know. I'm lost. Regardless, right, the memristor is crazy. Cause what, I mean, I guess it could have been like a rectifier diode. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything. All anyway. right. All right. So a memristor. A memristor is crazy because what it does is this, right? Right now, if you want to store like a bit, right? You want to remember a bit. The ways we have to do that are few. We can do a flip-flop, but a flip-flop, right? You lose the electricity. It's sort of, it's not flip-flopped anymore, really. All right? We could do a capacitor, which is what RAM does, but RAM... Uh, also loses when you turn the electricity off, right? Not immediately, but eventually. We can do like a circuit breaker kind of thing, which is just, re which is like what your BIOS does or your CMOS, which is incredibly slow. And it's like a bunch of switches moving back. It's terrible. We can do a magnet thing, which is your hard drive does. Also horrendously slow. So, and we can do flash also. And those are pretty much the big ones. There are, oh, we could do a register, but a register is flip-flops, right? So what else, you know, do you really, what are we, we going to do? The memristor is pretty much like the ultimate answer to this problem. What you have is they, they had this special, like, chemical. I forget what chemical they used. I didn't read it. I, it was like lead some, or I forget. Anyway, you send a current across the memristor in one direction, right? And as you send the, the current across, right, you, you send a direct current, DC, DC current across in one direction, across the memristor, and the resistance increases. And you send the direct current across in the other direction, and the resistance decreases. Now, so the, it's the like a resistor. The, the common thing that people mistake right away is that 
somehow you have to keep having this current there. It's like it's just you control it with the current. No, because it's the, the way the way it's made, the chemical that's in there, you apply the current and the chemical sort of moves and changes and now is more resistant and it's not going to move again unless you send some more direct current at it from one of the directions. And then what you do is you send an alternating current into the memristor. Now the alternating current won't move it. So it resistance level will ch will not change when sending an alternating current. But what you can do is you send the alternating current in one side and on the other side you can figure out by looking at the alternating current that comes out how much it resisted you. Thus, you use direct current to change the data that's in there and use alternating current to read. So it's this little thing, it's a circuit, and you can read and you can write. And not only can you read and you write one and zero, like you could say if the resistance is below one, it's zero, and if it's above one, it's one, right? And now you have basically what amounts to, you know, storing one bit of data, and it will store that one bit of data even if you turn all the electricity off, and it's wicked fast. But you could say, well, since I can, you know, basically change the resistance between, you know, the minimum resistance it can handle and the maximum, I could, you know, make sort of an analog thing. It could store any number from like zero to 100, maybe. I can make it, you know, I could divide it into 32 sections and say, look, I can store 32 possible values on this one memristor. And since it's really small and it's a fundamental component, you could get a whole zillion of these things in there. And that that's crazy. Like... In terms of what it means for, you know, consumer electronics, we're, it's probably going to start out with crazy fast RAM. It's non-volatile storage, but you can also use it for control. Yeah. It's going to start out with, like, we're maybe replacing Flash. You know, that IBM racetrack memory we talked about might be, you know, basically screwed. Um, we might be, you might see CPUs that have a lot of actual, like, storage space in them. Like, a CPU... Well, remember, it's where, not... The, the, in its current implementations, it's not that fast yet. No, it's not, it's, but it's gonna be. It's an or it's one. We're order talking of five to ten years. It's here. one order of magnitude slower than dynamic RAM. Right, but I mean, we're talking like a CPU where the register, like you could turn the electricity off on the computer, turn it back on, and the RAM and the CPU, which are if they're both just memristors, will pick up right where they left off. So you could turn your computer off, 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 completely off, and then turn it back on. And it will, won't even boot. It'll just be immediately back on where it was when you turned it off. That's, that's, all, that, that, that's like the beginning. That is like the first most obvious thing you can do with this amazing technology. I'm, I'm imagining more that with this sort of analog control, you could make very large branching networks and do really crazy kind of neural style that's, things. That's what the... That's what the, the the scientist type people are hoping is that because you know it's not just one or zero you can sort of get this levels of resistance that you can sort of you know get a few memristors together and sort of simulate something like a neuron or even if you can't make a brain you can make a computer that works more like a brain than like a core two duo anything else to say about the memristor about except about um, how amazing this is an amazing discovery of holy shit and as amazing as it is I'm full of allergies, and I'm just kind of waiting to bail tonight. Yeah, HP is the people who invented this, so invest in them when the stock... Well, the stock price already went up You're a little too late. Uh, do not take anything that I said today to be investment advice of any kind. No, Rim's not allowed to give investment advice, but and I know nothing about the stock market, except I won the stock market game when I was in, like, 10th grade. Oh, no, 7th grade. But, uh... Yeah, uh, if I would have known this news story a day before it hit the news, I would have bought HP that day. Well, actually, <laughs> the thing is, despite all the news about HP, there's at least one other company that has a patent for a very, very similar thing that will oh, do the same thing. Yeah, I would say, another a good, since it's already sort of too late to get the HP before it jumps up, I say wait for the, like, keep, pay attention to the patent story on this, because there might be, like... You know, all sorts of stuff like this is a fundamental thing. You can't patent it. There might be things like, well, this guy actually came up with it. You just made it. And this, you know, all the different specific parts of it are patented by different people. Well, and no, the, the idea is not that has nothing to do with it. If you're going to talk about patents, what is patented is the process. That is true. But and as manufacturing goes, I mean, remember, I worked in a manufacturing environment at IBM where we made like the, the cell chips, among other things. And the... 
the 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 art and the science of making the things counts for a billion times more than the theoretical or even the proof of concept. Yep. But I would keep an eye on how this patent war is going to play out, and whoever wins, I would uh, I would get your monies ready if you're that kind of person who likes to you know invest in stocks and not just your safe old four hundred one k. Again, I have no opinion whatsoever. Ram has no opinion. Um. Yeah, but it it's funny how like these amazing discoveries happen, but like most people either because they can't understand them or because I don't know the way the world is, like you don't sort of fully grasp it, you know, I don't know. It doesn't seem like this thing happens, this kind of in- amazing discovery happens too often anymore. You know what happened to him when he said everything that can be invented has been invented. You want to here, here's a layman's <laughs> way to understand why this is so revolutionary. Like here's the the proof there are now two terms that you will need to know in electronics. Memristance and memductance. Yeah. I mean, pretty much, they have to rewrite every electronics textbook. All of them. That's, it's that crazy. Like, and see, so, you know, there's advances now and then. You know, and, and there's advances all the time in electronics, actually. But none of them are like, okay, we have to rewrite the whole textbook right now. They're usually, okay, we'll revise the textbook and we'll make a few corrections here and there for new things we learned. This is throw your textbook out the window material here. This is, like, you might not see this again in your life, this kind of advancement. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, we have logic aids, like and, nand, or, nor. It's not possible with just, you know, with straight logic. But imagine if someone came up with a new gate. That did something else. I can't even think because there's no discrete math to go with the gate. It's not like this is discrete math well, that's and we because, don't have a gate to go with it. That's because, <laughs> like, saying, well, in the two-dimensional world, what, I know, what's, right? what's the third dimension? Like, no, nah, there isn't one. I know. It's like there is no logical uh, syllogism that we cannot, you know, make with gates. So it's like I couldn't even – this is – where we, basically the memristor is where we had the syllogism, but we didn't have the actual component to make it happen. But now we have it, which is why it's crazy. All right, it's like as if we knew we could do NAND on paper, but we didn't actually have a NAND gate. So and we had suddenly, to get around it. Suddenly, you know, that would have been the, the worst gate. case because NAND is the simplest gate. NAND it's is also the, the best most one. useful. I, I know. NAND, you can pretty much make everything that you can make with gates with NAND gates only. Well, what do you mean pretty much? You can. I know. That's why if you go to Radio Shack, you can buy a chip that's just like 40 NAND gates. Those are the best chips. It's just a big, long bug, and it's like, you know, these two and then that one, and these two goes with that one, and these two goes with that one, and they're all just NAND gates lined up. And on that note, I was muted and sneezing for a while, so I'm totally bailing. Yeah, let's bail. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontroadcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an Odeo on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it, as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.